Troy, is that a casserole? It's bagel bites and a deconstructed hot pocket reduction with a Doritos glaze. I just really want to make my food, you know? Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at Troy's casserole from Community. A, shall we say, hearty affair cobbled together from these three familiar after-school snacks. Bagel Bites, Doritos, and Hot Pockets. Now, this has been an episode that's been requested since the very beginning of Binging with Babish, and it's one I've been avoiding because the prospect of creating a quote-unquote good version really scares the shit out of me. I know that Troy was just screwing around, but how does one make a Doritos glaze, or most confoundingly deconstruct and reduce a Hot Pocket. To find out, I took one of these guys apart to see what makes them tick. And really, it's just a pastry shell containing a sort of sauce and cheese energy bar. One that I just can't recommend you eat frozen. But first things first, we gotta make the faithful recreation of the dish in question. Now, I figured the only way you could reduce a Hot Pocket was to let the sauce reduce a little bit, and the only way you're gonna be able to do that is to expose it to the air while it cooks. So into the bottom of a casserole dish goes six, uh, quite literally, deconstructed Hot Pockets which we are going to dot generously with pepperoni pizza bagel bites, turning each Hot Pocket into a little hot tub for two. And lastly, the Doritos, which again, I know were specified as a glaze, but in the show, it just kind of looked like they were crumbled on top. So that's what I'm gonna do, crumble a whole lot of Doritos on top until the bagel bites can no longer be seen. Cover and bake at 350 for about 30 minutes until piping hot throughout. And there you have it, Troy's casserole from Community. Only thing left to do now is give it a try. So I'm gonna retrieve one of these these hot pocket hot tubs, plate it up real nice, and tuck in. Now, I'm not gonna be so snooty as to say that this is bad. I grew up eating all three of these things, just not at the same time, which admittedly makes them taste a little crazy. So let's see if we can set out to make a gourmet spiritual successor to Troy's casserole. I have here before me all the raw ingredients necessary to make from scratch each element of this dish. And I'm going to start with the deconstructed hot pocket reduction, which I think should be some kind of riff on tomatoes. Holy sh that was a totally unnecessary camera trick. Anyway, like I was saying, I'm gonna focus mostly on the word reduction, which could be a sauce, but I'm going to interpret it as tomato confit, which are tomatoes that we're gonna cut across into the bottoms of and then blanch, followed by a shock in ice water, which is gonna give us the ability to easily remove their skins, just like we did in the ratatouille episode. So just gently boil your tomatoes for about 30 seconds until the skins start to split and drop them in an ice bath. You'll notice that I'm doing this with a whole lot of tomatoes, of different colors. That's because in an effort to make this dish as chef-y as possible, I'm going to confit these tomatoes and then puree them, and then gelatinize those purees into a rainbow terrine. All those words will make sense in a few minutes. First, to confit the tomatoes, we're going to cut them into similar sized pieces and place them cut side down as crowded as possible on a rimmed baking sheet. For a little extra flavor, we're going to scatter some quartered shallots around the tomatoes as well as a few cloves of crushed garlic. And then confit is a cooking method where you cook the food in question in a whole lot of fat, so we're going to drizzle these generously with olive oil, followed by a generous pinch of kosher salt and a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Then these guys are headed into a 225 degree Fahrenheit oven for about four hours, during which time we're going to get started on our Doritos flavors. First, some sliced red and green bell peppers are headed into the dehydrator. And you remember those tomato skins that you saved? You didn't, you didn't save those? Why not? They are just packed with tomato flavor, and they're very easy also to dehydrate. We're also going to do some sliced onions, some sliced garlic, all the major flavor players in Doritos. They are headed into a 125 degree Fahrenheit dehydrator for at least 16 hours. Well before then, our confit tomatoes emerge from the oven looking pretty good. And now to gelatinize and terrinify them, we need some gelatin. Four packets of unflavored gelatin that we're going to sprinkle over a half cup of water. Then we're going to slowly pour in an additional half cup of hot water water while tiny whisking constantly until completely dissolved. This is going to be our primary solidifier. Now I want to assemble my terrine in four layers, sort of like a tomato rainbow. So I'm going to start with all my greenest tomatoes, to which I'm going to add about a quarter cup of our gelatin mixture, and we're going to pulse them together in a food processor until relatively smooth. We're then going to pour the mixture into a plastic wrap lined loaf pan, tap it a few times to make sure that it's even, and refrigerate for one hour or until relatively solidified. Then we're going to repeat the process this 
this time with the yellowy tomatoes, carefully pouring over the rounded back of a spoon atop our green tomatoes to make sure that it doesn't disturb the first layer. Back into the fridge for an hour, and then we're rinsing and repeating with our two remaining layers, orange and red. I know this isn't making a whole lot of sense, but you'll see where I'm going with it. Once the terrine is filled, we're gonna cover it with plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least six hours or until completely solidified throughout. I'm gonna go get some sleep and I'll see you guys after the commercial break. The next day, and all of our dried vegetables emerge from the dehydrator, looking pretty dehydrated. Just make sure that once they've cooled off, they're brittle and easily snap when snapped. Then, one at a time, we're using a spice grinder to grind all the vegetables into their powdered form. I ground up some Fresno chilies too, just in case we want to do a spicy sweet chili flavor, but this proved rather noxious. Luckily, you've probably got one of these lying around. This is probably also going to be the point during the voiceover that you remember that Claire Saffitz already did Doritos dust, and you probably could have just copied her method, but but just push those feelings down, and let's start adding ingredients in the order that they are on the ingredients list. That is a teaspoon each, salt, cheddar powder, buttermilk powder, and Romano cheese powder, then a half teaspoon each of your homemade garlic powder, tomato powder, red pepper powder, and green pepper powder. Go ahead and give that a tiny whisking until homogenous, and it's not quite red enough, so I'm gonna add a little bit more red pepper powder and tomato powder until it at least looks like a distant cousin of a Doritos dust. And I gotta say, it tastes pretty good, not exactly like Doritos, but pretty close, and more than close enough for our purposes. Next up, the bagel element, and since I wanted this to be a kind of plated up fork and knife vibe, I thought a savory donut might be a better direction. So into the bowl of a stand mixer goes 350 grams of all-purpose flour, one tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon and a half of instant yeast, and a tablespoon of cornmeal to bring back some of that corn chip flavor. I'm also gonna grate in four ounces of Parmesan cheese, which I think is gonna lend a delightful cheesiness to our donut. Set that aside in a smaller bowl we're combining three quarters of a cup of buttermilk with two tablespoons of unsalted melted butter and one large egg. Beat these guys up with a tiny whisk until combined, and then it's time to bring it all together. Pour the wet ingredients into a well formed in the center of the dry ingredients. Attach your favorite dough hook to your favorite stand mixer. Drop the head, crank it on medium-low speed. Remember that you didn't plug it in. That was embarrassing, glad nobody saw that. And start mixing this guy on medium-low speed and let him go for about five minutes until everybody comes together into a cohesive of massive dough. Then let the machine knead the dough for one to two minutes until it's nice and smooth. Retrieve it from the bowl and give it a few ancillary kneads just to make sure that it's all nicely kneaded and then return it to the bowl, which we have generously oiled, and then wrap it in plastic wrap and let it rise at room temperature for one to one and one half hours, or until doubled in size. Do that little hands thing you do when you come back and see something's risen. Let the dough know who's boss and punch it down and then turn it out onto a well-floured work surface, where we are going to roll it out to a thickness of about half an inch. Use this time to ponder whether or not you're making the right decision by swapping donuts for bagels. Push those feelings down and begin using a donut cutter to cut your dough into donuts. And just in case these look too donut-like, I'm gonna make a few custom jobs where I cut out a smaller hole so it more closely resembles a bagel. We are then laying these guys out onto a parchment-lined rim baking sheet, lightly oiling a few sheets of food-grade plastic wrap, and then draping said plastic wrap in a frankly very graceful motion over our soon-to-be donuts. After they've rested for about 30 minutes at room temperature, that is. Then they are headed directly into some 350 degree Fahrenheit vegetable oil, where we're gonna fry them for about 90 seconds per side until they're puffed up and golden brown and crisp. Drain them on a wire rack, set in a rimmed baking sheet, and immediately sprinkle with kosher salt as soon as they come out the oil. And there you have it, some Parmesan cornmeal donuts, which don't taste half bad, they're a little boring. But as the knife and fork basis for our pizza flavors, they're gonna be kinda perfect. So next up, it has been many, many, many hours, and our terrine is ready to emerge from the fridge. Now, this silly application aside, this tomato terrine would actually be really lovely with some burrata paired with a crisp white wine on a summer's day. And I know it's not much to look at right now, but it's going to work very nicely for our purposes. The rainbow effect isn't as pronounced as I had hoped, but it's going to do the job. Next up, we have to address the cheese elements of this dish, namely the four cheeses for which Hot Pockets are most famous. I'm going to start by combining some Parmesan, provolone, and most confoundingly, cheddar, finely shredded into a three of our four cheese mix. From these cheeses, I'm going to make a cheese crisp by placing 
a small mound onto a super non-stick surface like a silpat and bake at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for about 7 minutes until the fats have separated and it becomes crisp after cooling off on a wire rack. Then I'm going to cut these guys into pretty little rounds using a biscuit cutter and then on to the last elements of the dish, the Doritos glaze, which I think is going to be very nice in the form of a hollandaise. So I'm dumping four egg yolks into the base of an immersion blender jar, pouring half a cup of bubbling hot butter into a spouted container, and gently streaming the hot butter down the side of the container while I run an immersion blender. About halfway through, I'm going to add a few teaspoons of our Doritos dust and continue blending until we have a nice, thick Doritos hollandaise. And now, finally, we're ready to plate up one of the most complicated and most unnecessary dishes in this show's history. First, I'm going to lop off a thin slice of our rainbow terrine and use the same biscuit cutter to cut it into a round. Then I'm going to carefully cut our bagel slash donut in half, carve off a thin slice of buffalo mozzarella, and get ready to pull off the most important chef smear of my life. Perfect. Well, almost perfect. A little bit longer. Perfect. Atop our smear of hollandaise goes our half bagel slash donut, followed by a thin layer of mozzarella cheese, our tomato colfi rainbow terrine, and to complete the cheese quadfecta, our parmesan provolone and cheddar crisp. And there you have it, this batch crazy thing. Community returned yesterday with a full cast table read, and I could not think of a better way to celebrate. And sure, it's pretty in a beautiful on the inside kind of way, but how does it taste? Well, first let's lay down this crisp for slightly easier consumption, give it a generous dip in our Doritos Hollandaise, and see if this dish that took two full days to make was worth the effort. And the answer is not really. Each element was good on its own, but just like the casserole from which it was inspired, its flavors were confused together. That said, it did enter the I worked really hard on this so it's getting in the clean plate club club. But literally, as I was doing the voiceover at 10 p.m. the night before you're watching this episode, I had an idea that I couldn't really pass up. Here I had made savory donuts, and it would be criminally negligent of me not to make an actual Doritos glaze. So into the bowl of the stand mixer goes one cup of powdered sugar, a few teaspoons of our Doritos dust, and two tablespoons of 2% milk beaten on high speed until it forms a thick, sweet, spicy glaze. One that's genuinely going to work perfectly on our Parmesan cornmeal donut. Now, I did try one one of these on its own, but I forgot to hit record because it was late and I was tired. But I did remember to record the recreation of this as a sandwich version of the dish from earlier. Are my words still making sense? I can't really tell. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when this is viewed by millions of people. And the verdict on the donut sandwich version of Troy's casserole is, again, not bad, but pretty all over the place flavor-wise. But you can see it's getting some small handshakes of approval. And look, you can just tell I want to take another bite. Go on, do it. Take another bite. Go on. This episode went totally off the rails. Nobody's going to judge you. There you go. That's what binging with Babish is all about.